next speaker is our very own Helen Flynn. Um, so Helen is uh, Just Fair's Head of Policy, Research and Campaigns. Uh, she's got over 10 years experience researching and campaigning on behalf of civil society, community groups, grassroots organisations, uh, towards the better realisation of human rights. Helen's got a particular interest in the domestic in implementation of international human rights standards and works it to find ways to better facilitate access to United Nations monitoring mechanisms which we definitely benefit from at Just Fair, I must say. Uh, she holds uh, LLM in Human Rights and Criminal Justice from Queen's University, Belfast. Over to you, Helen. Thank you so much. So, in January 2023, Just Fair submitted an independent parallel report to the United Nations Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights on behalf of civil society in England and Wales. They are the yellow covered documents that were all at the door as she came in. The report was evidence-led and by that we mean we received over 70 submissions, both written and oral. So what did it show? It showed that five years on from Philip Alston's visit, people in England and Wales enjoy vastly different levels of realization of their rights. It showed that the cost of living crisis is a catastrophe for many and poses a real threat to people's lives, but also that the current crisis has not happened in a vacuum. As with COVID-19, and the decade of austerity that was thrust upon people of the UK, these crises are disproportionately impacting specific groups of people. And it's often the same groups of people each time. That is, black people and people of colour, older and disabled people and their families, gypsy, traveller and Roma people, women, our LGBT plus communities, those in poverty, insecure housing or precarious employment, and people who have come to the UK to escape difficult circumstances in their home countries. Five years on, these groups are experiencing disproportionate and compounded violations of their economic, social and cultural rights, in stark contrast to the general population. In addition, we've seen in work poverty on the increase. So it's not an exaggeration to say that some people are struggling to survive. They simply have no reserves left, and the civil society organizations who are trying to help them have run out of ways to paper over the cracks caused by UK government policies. In our report, you're gonna find a lot of really shocking statistics. Don't think that's for me. Um, so one in four children in the UK is growing up in poverty, and if we focus in on wheels, that number rises to 34%. In the northeast of England, 99% of households that are subject to the benefit cap are families with children. Six out of 10 people with learning disabilities die before the age of 65. Gypsy, Roma and traveler children have the lowest education attainment at all stages of compulsory education. 85% of minority ethnic pupils participating in workshops facilitated by show races and the red card wheels reported experiencing racism in school or in the community. Unemployment of black young people was 41.6%, three times that of unemployment of white young people at the peak of the pandemic. And 14% of trans respondents to the Trans Live Survey reported being refused care because they were trans. In addition to this, it's important to note that when the UK government does seemingly offer solutions, they are limited solutions which only further trap people in a cycle of experiencing violations of their rights. In the State Party report that the UK government provided to the UN Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, the UK government claimed that their focus is on helping people move into and progress in work, based on clear evidence that this is the best way to tackle all forms of poverty. However, our report evidenced that in-work poverty is on the increase rising from 13% of in-work households being in poverty in 1996 to 7, to 17% in 2019 to 20. Insufficient wages, the prevalence of insecure contracts, exploitation by employers, and the soaring cost of childcare give lie to the idea that work is a universal route out of poverty in the UK. 
Furthermore, this focus on individual responsibility and an attempt to deflect state responsibility is deeply insidious and creates a culture where people blame themselves for the violations of their rights which they experience, rather than placing responsibility on duty bearers to uphold the standards which they voluntarily agreed to be bound by in ratifying the covenant on economic, social, and cultural rights. But I always like to find a positive note. And to be honest, in this case, it wasn't very difficult. Without preempting the next panel too much, there is hope that things can be different and that things can be better. I'd urge you all to check out a recent report by Alma Economics. Their research using independent HM Treasury guidelines showed that incorporating the right to adequate housing in Wales would save money for current and future generations. 11.5 billion of benefits would be realized across the public purse and society against estimated costs of 5 billion over a 30 year period. The report evidences that public money could be saved by NHS Wales, that homelessness could be ended, and that our communities could be made safer by reduced crime. In addition, recent polling carried out by Opinion and kindly financed by Amnesty International and Liberty shows that the general public is way ahead of our politicians at Westminster when it comes to protecting economic, social, and cultural rights. The polling found that economic, social, and cultural rights are overwhelmingly popular with the public in the UK. And when we break down different elements of the rights contained within the, economic, sorry, the covenant on economic, social, and cultural rights, there is very little opposition. We're pushing at an open door with the UK public. So when Opinium asked 2,005 people across the UK, do you think people in the UK should have the right to the following? This is what they told us. To be able to choose their job or move to a new job, 92% said yes. To be and feel safe at work, 95% said yes. To be paid a fair wage at work, 95% said yes. To be treated equally to others at work, 93% said yes. To be able to have rest days and holidays from work, 92% said yes. To be able to join a trade union, 86% said yes. To be able to strike to fight for fair pay and working conditions, 77% said yes. To be able to receive help from government if they cannot work because of illness, maternity, or disability, 93% said yes. To have financial protection through a social security system, 83% said yes. To have adequate food for them and their families, 90% said yes. To have a comfortable and secure home, 88% said yes. To have adequate clothing for them and their families, 88% said yes. To have access to good quality physical and mental health services and treatment when needed, 92% said yes. To be protected from preventable disease and ill health, 91% said yes. To have support for the family when needed, for example, social care, 89% said yes. To quality education for themselves and their children, 92% said yes. So my message today is that there is nothing to fear for decision makers in calling loudly and working effectively towards the effective incorporation of economic, social, and cultural rights in the UK. They are not only the legally and morally right choice, the economically prudent choice, but they are also the popular choice. Thank you.